Light Light is, is Julie Jostin's first book. Her poems and reviews can be read in Jacket 2, Tarpaulin Sky, The Malahat Review, and The Fiddlehead. She lives in Toronto, and we are so glad to have her here with us tonight. Please welcome Julie Jostin. Hi. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah. I just wanted to thank Prairie Lights, thank you, Lindsay, and thank everyone who's come out. I appreciate it. Um, Light Light emerged out of uh, what was to me a somewhat surprising obsession that developed around 18th and 19th century botany. Mm -hmm. I just started reading obsessively and writing um, and it became a, a really interesting way to think about modes of knowing and ideas of humanness and colonialism and empire um, all through the travel of plants. So um, I'll read a few few poems, one of which is um, longer, and it's called If Light Stabilizing, If to Receive a Bee. I've read that the art of the solitary hunter is empathy. Taking time, the hunter invites the hunted subtlety into her own. A bee orchid appears to have a bee or wasp resting on it, and its petals give off the scent of female bees. These contrivances lure male bees to the orchid in a deception so complete a bee will devote itself briefly, entirely, to the orchid, pseudo-mating with it. In this excitement, the bee is covered in pollen and pollinates the orchids it later visits. Flowers appear as bees, entice them, are violated by them. In this story, the bee orchid the bee orchid is not empathic, but often offers a lesson in subtlety. Enchanted by subtleness, Maria Sibella Marion, 1647 to 1717, studied and drew the metamorphoses of insects, processes whose minute alterations are so gradual as to be almost imperceptible. Of looking in curiosity cabinets, Marion wrote, I found these and numerous other insects, but such that their origins and reproduction were lacking. That means how they changed from caterpillars into pupae and so forth. All this inspired me to take a long and costly, expensive journey and go to Suriname in order to continue my observations there. Marion, after whom eventually six species of plants, nine butterflies, and two beetles were named. Marion, who voyaged solely for silence, science. Voyaging as a form of hunting, hunting a form of worship, collecting caterpillars in the cool of morning, preparing them in the evening with the sun setting, overseeing the uprooting of plants in the forest and along rivers and their replanting in a garden, watching as plants grow, bloom, blow, and following the insects that visit them in these unfoldings, attending to the silent transformations of caterpillars camouflaged on stems and leaves. Prayer not as petition, but as attention, an unexpected grace, thought, also called love, becomes an indirect light, stabilizing perception in a self ceasing to be, to attend to the existence of caterpillars, of orchids. Qualities of light, slant, reflectivity, color, illumination, empathy without seizure, light's ability to receive a bee, an ocean, a ship, while retracting itself from view. 18th and 19th century botanical illustrations arrived in Amsterdam, Paris, London, Madrid, in crates by Maritime Post. The figure of an orchid or a peacock flower islanded on a white page, flowering in static lushness, having dissolved geography, local knowledge, use, and name, 
as if in salt water crossing the sea. You don't think of form by the sea. Agnotology, the study of culturally produced ignorances. Agnotology extends the questions what and how we know to include what we do not know and how we do not know it. I don't know the Arawak or the Carib name for peacock flower. No one does anymore. Marion relied on Amerindian and African slaves to help her find her choice specimens and to protect her in her travels. She called them Minaslavan. They, nameless, cut openings for her to pass through dense forests, paddled her along rivers, dug up roots, planted, and helped tend her garden, gave maggots, caterpillars, fireflies, gave shells, and peacock flowers. The elegant, pe the elegant peacock flower, Flos Pavinos, Marion called it, is inflorescent, which sounds like a quality of light or lightness but designates a cluster of flowers arranged on a stem. The peacock flower has 20 to 30 flaming red and yellow flowers. Marion's depiction includes the plant's leaves, burnished seeds, and glowing flowers, along with three stages of the tobacco hornworm moth. Light sea green caterpillar, red pupa, and a large moth with a snaking proboscis <coughs> gathering nectar from a flower. Marion wrote, the Indians who are not treated well by their Dutch masters use the seeds of the peacock flower to abort their children so that their children will not become slaves like they are. The black slaves from Guinea and Angola have demanded to be well treated, threatening to refuse to have children. They told me this themselves. Told me this themselves, often preferring to say nothing, secrecy another form of resistance lying from this worm, a handsome grasshopper, another. <coughs> Following this description, Marion drew a be beetle larva, two praying mantises, and an egg cocoon on a lush nipple fruit full of deep greens and shining yellows, documenting what the slaves told her. To trace a trade route by which something did not happen. Knowledge of the abortive powers of the peacock flower did not travel with the plant to European gardens and curiosity cabinets and was never noted in medical encyclopedias or herbalist manuals. It is difficult to look at the sun. Quiet on the floor of a house you can enter if you encounter nothing. Slave women, peacock flowers, mothers of unhappening. Um, I'll next read a few sections from a long poem in the center of the book, and it's called Once Sun. The valley carries cemeteries in its mouth, ground sound to seed and buries it. There is a world and the world inside it. This the haunting dissension, an elaboration of the blind field its quickening cast out from the eye, shivering into gestures of birds, the ground mottled with flight. The clothes on the bank tell the river of others. Side-saddled skirts hang the horse's back, the heartbeat of the horse. To touch that stake of pulse, marrow light held in the hand, whalebone stays hovering the skirt, ghosts corsetry, the way falling at a certain angle Rain severs the eye. If weather dresses wind whiter, if drowning cliff and valley foundering, night falling morning, if storm fronting, anvil cloud tumbling, horse striking, darkness deeper piling, if flint, if fist, if gibbet, if bide, if sky. From the half-lit lip of sky, I tip away so gently, I can speak only in place of, have felt my mouth rash with, riding, driving, pulling, chariot, buggy, cart. I plummet, I rifle, I debt unsung. If you came from the field, born like grass, and the hutch of sun that held cloud and no rain, that waited rain in the antechamber of your mountain, 
a small hill bearing weather with the reserve of a regiment newly outfitted, but seasoned nonetheless by early scraps in first uncertain days. If in the morning you woke in the field and then hammered a bird skull, white as surrender, to a nearby birch, giving vision texture, the bone whites extending into the plane of sight and straight through that to the hold of touch. If it began with perception and will end with perception, and you hold me close when it breaks, close enough to hear the cracking but not to feel its vibration, when you, eating birch bark, carrying me on your back, licking the trees, melt snow in your mouth and feed me, you may see a horse among rocks, see it unsaddle the field. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is a love poem that involves a dissection. <laughs> the cause closest to the body. The voice is not an invisible thing as lungs under the skin. The heart can be held in the hand. If I tremble into H, not my hand, this hand, only hand, heart in hand. Here, take this, gift of an H, take it as given. If the heart in the hand sings like a thrush, if learning by heart what is held in the hand, the thrush in the hand beats like a heart. The human is given, the hand sings, two notes at once, one rising, one falling. Your first cut is a deep Y through the arcing chest. Your second, a V through the slender neck. Lungs, bronchi, larynx, mouth, nose. Yours is the hand singing the knife, singing buzz, saw, buzz. The voice unfolding the skin, saying hush now, hush. Rocking the head in the boat of your hand. Rocking the brain from the home of the skull. Tempting the song, subtler. I, I, I. Yours is the heart I know by hand. It says, what is a voice? Touch me. Um, this is a poem called Wind <coughs> Scene. Keats writes in a letter to his friend Reynolds, let us open our leaves like a flower and be passive and receptive. I was led in these thoughts, dear Reynolds, by the beauty of the morning operating on a sense of idleness. I have not read any books. The morning said I was right. I had no idea but of the morning. The beauty of the morning, its transparency becomes thought, dissolves identity and reception in feeling an idea of the morning. This feeling belongs to no one in particular. A sense of idleness is as much the beauty of the morning as Keats's own. Keats who becomes for the morning, the morning. How astonishingly abstract the body and soul are by comparison. The morning sends out a small wind, carries a bee along, and brushes pollen from the combs of the bee's legs. Pollen lingers in a swirl and surfaces on the cup of a poppy. And this is a poem in short sections called Stormfront Then. If there's a river to music and a current to whiter than birch, if A is to arc or amnesty, if to light is to cross light snow, stone still and wan in sunlight, if flight to bird's wing is sunlight. If you find yourself in a room with the piano and you find you know how to play, the remains of the room opening onto a field, if you find music and a soldier who cannot remember his name to turn the pages, perhaps begin playing, notes shuddering into wasp swings, into black ink of the iris, a winter shore you can't help remembering, low notes of laughter, candlelight. If room, hands, if hands, piano, perhaps, one or perhaps two, skies, perhaps. If you find yourself breathless in an empty room and unhinge the ceiling with your hands to open out a full moon that returns in the future as a violet dwindling away. There is talk of horsepower because you were born in a buggy, but you shuttle through, the spa through space on the thrust of engines. They, th they purr, throttle, demure before the horse that pulled the piano from your parents' house to this one. The bullet that struck you, cavalry, contained traces of arsenic. Arsenic preserves wood, 
but it is best not to burn wood preserved by it. If from the ground walls and from the sky ceiling, if piano from the trees and the horizon from the glance of a bayonet into the sun, if we forget the keys, the lock, the frame, have forgotten the door altogether, rifle a pear, call up russet and the juice of plums, know a plum is for eating, the mouth, the tongue, the teeth, Recall the dangers of ice, of marching through trees, the angle of light as we step and hold a moment, comprehension as time, not space, doubt as time too, that angle of light as we, the morning quiet keening into dawn, feel our hearts about to burst, settle soft upon the day. We are quiet in the trees, walk silence out of the ground. Um, and then I'll close with just with three poems um, that I wrote after the book. Um, the first is called Beside the Library Lions. Um, the bed is an island, is a page, is a blue door opening onto the bird in your veins. Someone writes of a language that heals as much as it separates. Someone writes of gathering scattered elements and covering them with words to embolden existence. Someone writes of a language that restores equilibrium but doesn't absolve a debtor from debt. It's snowing. There's a dead boy whom I loved, whom now I love as my child. The locality of love alters. The bird in your heart holds its silence up to such distance. Invent a form of to love. Invent a local anguish, population 1213. From thence to thou, bird-shaped and blue, from thou to, the, to thee in the library air is, from thee to thy deaths, met and unmet, extending as electrons or accidents or architecture. Your, plum, your poem floods the nervous system, dear Chad. Um, this is a poem called Poem Radial to Lines by William Wordsworth and Denise Riley. Birdsong untongued becomes a nest. In the center this nest is thy mind's a nightingale, blue throat from a field of shadow. In the darkness beyond blue, other minds. To share the transport, oh, with whom but thee, a whom, whom now, whithersoever, in the minds of others. We've come to this pass come to this pass, that water closes over, <coughs> annihilate, a noun I move as. Nouns and verbs resemble thought, a movement registering its arrival with the warmth of disappearing. From the ragged edge of spring and the ragged edge of thought, a way of being to praise your being, the mountain the garden borrows. I come to this pass, in the folds of a violet, a violet. I work to earth my heart. And the final poem is um, called A Rose Resembles a Blossom, which is a line from um, Stein. A treetop blossomed resembles a cloud, and the flight of a bird a violet resembles crosses both. A falling leaf resembles a bee, a bee resembles a rhythm. Flying, it's arcing indifference, light all over it. Have you seen Poussin's late trees trembling in the wind as the water below passes the reflection to the sky? To the sky, it's motion, treetops and clouds undulating to indistinguishability, a horizontal streaming of breath and brown ink. The mechanics of rhythm, increment, pivot, extend to feeling. Rhythm referred once to the positions the body assumed during a dance, not flow, but pause. And I, existing where feeling is, a line that breathes, 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 climbs through wood, branch, leaf, and blossom, dissolving each, and the eye, the ear. A perceptual style resembles a synapse, his brush, his hand, his hand, his brush, trembling. Thank you.
you, Julie Justin. Next up, Caroline Manring will read from her first full-length book of poems, Manual of Extinction, which won the 2012 National Poetry Review Book Contest. Dean Young says, Caroline Manring's Manual for Extinction is guided by a sensual mind, one that is sharply aware of mortal outcomes, and a deep sense of the comedy in any of the intellect's know-how attempts. This is rambunctious work, frisky with mordant play and verbal swing. Rarely does such vibrant formal innovation couple with a keening grittiness. Manring is the author of the poetry chapbook, No Postman, and her work has appeared in Colorado Review, Conduit, Drunken Boat, Sixth Finch, and other literary magazines. She has been a member of the faculty at Ithaca College and El Elmira College, and currently teaches in the English department at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, where she is also a poetry editor for the Seneca Review. Please welcome Caroline Manry. I'm going to start with water because <clears throat> inevitably when you're about to do something you're deeply pleased about, you immediately contract a virus from your students. So bear with me. Thank you so much to Prairie Lights and to Lindsay and to Julie for agreeing to, to do this. It's been lovely. How to go extinct. A bird's mouth is its gape, as when young beg. No one let us go awry. We just got some heavy focus on and failed to write home. We found a pasture and delivered ourselves into it. Unprepared, we found things happen before our hands untwist the wire. How to number the abundant things while they are still abundant. At the field days of desire, there was a booth for shooting skylarks. Sometimes rhetoric is just a lone stud horse. Three forests, one untouched, one logged, one raised, sustained the same birds, but not the same beetles. We must make endings meet. This is a place called Earth. I hurried to the fence and said I too wanted a horse. How to assess damage. I never dealt in hundred dollar bills before. Are you the rake or the coals pleased to break you? And the fox was tricked and fell into the creamy water, but I don't deal in middles, so I can't say how. Holding this pose is brutal, and the cello begins to sound like a shuttle with a known hairline fracture entering anyway. No one listened to the engineers. They're perfect equations that put the debris right through your eye. How to factory farm. Created and stung, the body's task was to be middling, where it could remain safe. So the body set its heart on becoming a government, with enough bad backstory to make a good novel. Ruby Foreman's job was to pick up chicken heads. She forgot how many she'd held at the end of each day because numbers numbed her. No matter how many times you count, you still have to cram your tenderness down their throats so they can die well, as with a prayer or a flash of heavy silver from the gorgeous heaving water. How to live on the plains. I want to haul myself onto earthly flotsam, not anything too intimate. Just me and some geese scattering by on course. When we are arranged by crop, you can see we are a toothy, forever naked, ragtag lot. There are hands deft enough to find diagnostic sweetnesses. Untrained, we and our examiners go wanly waiting. 
never a crossing to speak of. But here in my heart, there is no accidental pony. How to get out of inverted staff pose. If anybody's familiar with yoga, you know how brutal that one is. I can't do it. This doesn't mean I can do it. How to get out of inverted staff pose. And you can't be anything other than whole, than the busting of the ribs, than that was imaginary. Ask a partner to tip you over. If a beast can cross a meadow, if you cannot be ruined, if your body is a blade, if you cannot be ruined, if a beast can cross a meadow, ask a partner to tip you over. Then that was imaginary. Then the busting of the ribs. And you can't be anything other than whole. Hydraulic fracture. Name the blaze. Bear it in a box. My father's tourniquet makes an oar lock. Racked with possession, we row on land. How to be extinct. All the banging became coherent, like subtitles, siphoning ocean into a bowl. What can we subtract to expose substrate like a billion dollar tomb? Sometimes you. Then I see the footprints in the dregs are avian or a moths. Often we remove with partial success the competing heartbeat. Have you ever spread someone's ashes with your hands? I take mules into the stable of my heart and wonder why there are so precious few escapes. How to play the most beautiful quartet in the world. To step on a fox tooth or a fish bone on the railroad tracks and not know what it is opens one vein in an evening that wasn't there before. One more place for blood to go. My sister is not the queen, but she is one such place. In every student, there's a teacher causing problems. Like a statue you sat on and didn't have the heart to let anyone know. You stay seated, present at the bridal shower. Like the shuttle launch, the Mars fanatic somehow forgot to calendar, but it happens, and brightly too. Rescued or not, with binoculars, one can learn a bird's field marks all right though one may never be great at reading the sky. How to disappear. If we do this anymore, it might buy the farm. And us skinny owls in a shed. But love labors only labor, which is lost, and lost only lost, which is watched. How to become pregnant. Just under the soloist's gaze is a lens-shaped cloud. It is the arc in the sky where mountain turbulence can kill you. Pilots patrol the outer reaches. Part of the arrangement is they know little of what they protect and maintain. I heard Maria Callas sing twice, once, over the noise of a car whose driver was trying to shake me from his heart. The driver's ed instructor would have explained that my choice to listen at that time threatened our well-being. Sunsick. Hair falls, harp notes cut above a slow drain does not land. Down and down a downy, oh, sigh for a shroud. I can make no wool. Can I have your hairs to keep? Can I hold your middle? Can I tell you I'm a sheep? No, then try a fiddle. I'm quaking by the bedrock. I'm buying by stacked stones. I'd gone acres quartz before I knew there was no shade in the satchel and no shade for the bone.
Total agreement. One. The Pratt and Whitney wasp has a human sound. <coughs> Two. Not many aphorisms survive, and none to a tune you'd know. Three. Atrocity stops to sing a song in a valley full of larks. Four. A copy of a wolf and the wolf itself are the same if you draw them both. How to drown in four inches of water. They lowered the lake level before we could trailer her out off her keel and a thousand said and unsaid things. Where's the submersion that would seal the summer in a hissing lunge like hot iron into water, leaving its color behind? The sail borders stay into November with only each other's pennants and the shallow water to crisscross. That's how big the whole world is punctuated by waterfowl tough as Jack Dempsey. It turns out Muhammad Ali was really funny. Maybe we can watch that documentary. I never wanted to love anything more than your swanky frame. How to go extinct. And this is uh, for the ivory billed woodpecker. Cecil's kints took up a lot of time. Why couldn't a grown man pack it in? People sat on his porch trying to find out and left with a story about a mule. He had every drawing of the peckerwood anyone could have. Cecil knew Rod Billings shot some in the 20s, a mated pair, and never found the tree again to see if there was a nest. The skins got him cash from a collector and a piece in the paper. Cecil heard the truck gutter out and his head filled with static. Up to his neck in swamp, he sometimes saw incisions in the sky faster than a wood duck and felt the back of his eyeballs go cold with the effort and desire. <coughs> Ithaca, with a K. And this is for Martha, the last known passenger pigeon who died September 1st, 1914. I'm rolling in the truck bed, wound in wire. I can't recall any jokes, so it seems I shouldn't be naked. Across the trestle, low as a grouse, one hears rumors of freight. The spring crow grows strong. The hoarder's hands flutter and chime with coin. I want more, said the great Odysseus. The singer has forgotten that and many other parts of this song. I don't have any new poems because what I have instead is a novel now. <laughs> no, no, that's what I ended up with. So I'm going to read a very short chapter from that. This novel is populated by geologists and ornithologists and is centered around the issue of hydraulic fracturing for natural gas, which is a big issue in my hometown and a lot of places now. Um, I wouldn't say it's about that, but it's centered around it. This is one of the chapters that has nothing to do with any of the other characters, so I thought it would read well. She was a sapwood yellow-green, as so many are. The faint gathering of light tips on her secondary coverts made a line of color across her wing, not unlike a plow's score in a wet field, or leaning wheat after hard weather when it comes together and makes shapes. The same kinds of shapes gathered behind her eye, almost vireo-like, but not so distinguished or organized. The pad of her cheek feathers with the shape of a ginkgo leaf, even though she'd never seen one, and never would. As for the two males nearest her just then, one south and one a little off south as they worked the dark air, one was young like her, also leaving the place and time of his birth for the first time. The other was deeply colored in a slaty but glowing blue with white ornaments 
and gave re regular sp calls every hundred wing beats or so, which seemed to organize her own heartbeat. They had been working for just over seven hours this time. When the sun with its silence changed the sky, before even it knew what it was doing, they would come down out of the air faster and harder than bodies that weigh as much as a milkweed pod should be able to. They wore cloaks of exhaustion that only the traveler can know. They would go, all of them, to sapling branches that did or did not bend with their afterthought mass and wait for the insects to stir and climb a little after dawn. Then it was not sleep that they'd gather, but one tiny body at a time, one or two every minute, until their own bellies stopped piercing their consciousnesses with the urgency for fuel, which sometimes never happened in a day. Sometimes her hunger drove her all the way through the daylight until they gathered to leave, suddenly, like a bouquet of rushes thrown into the sky. The dark male took a single, hesitating flap. She felt her body release and descend, her kind all around her living the same motion. They were landing early. She was troubled by the pull of the south like a current or a wind, though there was no wind just then, which is why they hadn't gone as fast or far last night. They were stopping early, and the southing wasn't done yet. But the dark male was landing, and they were all landing, and there would be no food until the light came back, always at exactly the time her organs began their slow pulse, like the squeezing of a sponge, to tell her so. And then they weren't landing anymore. They were arcing and cascading down in the rushed calligraphy of hunger. They were just falling, numb and hot, no air to be found. Her body was crashing against itself to find air. For seven hours, it had continuously made the equivalent of a runner's four-minute mile, and now it was saying it could not breathe for her to pay back this enormous debt. It was fast, dying, compared to the work they had done, was easy. Compared to finding food or clinging to a wet branch through a 14-hour storm or digging herself out of the egg hour after hour before she could even know why, ending was quiet and quick. Because her body could not keep living, she stopped. 689 warblers of mixed species were found on the ground, apparently unharmed but dead, outside a small town called Rigby in southern Pennsylvania. They looked, the farmer said to the news anchor, like assorted candies spread across his lawn, or maybe like those flowers, the ones people toss at the bride when she leaves. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Caroline Manring, and thank you, Julie Jostin. Uh, their books, um, respectively, are Manual for Extinction and Light, Light, and I'm sure both authors would be happy to sign copies of their books for you. Thanks for coming.